our speaker today is Pamela Powers Hanley. She is our current representative in LD9. She is a progressive warrior, has, write, writ, uh, has written for the Blog for Arizona. She got her undergraduate education in journalism from Ohio State. She got her master's in public health from the University of Arizona. She is an avid fighter for women's rights, for health care, for pretty much every progressive cause that exists. And so we are very excited to hear from her today about upcoming legislation in the state legislature. Give it up for Representative Pamela powers Hammond. My talk today is about economic inequality, access to care, and workforce development. Uh, a few weeks ago, I attended a talk by economist Dean Baker. Uh, he was sponsored by Lucha and by PALF. And the focus of his talk was on solving economic inequality. And uh, he came up with basically five key areas that keep the rich rich and keep the rest of us in our places. And so the, the, the five things that he came up with were macroeconomics, intellectual property rights, practice protection by professionals, financial regulation, and all corporate governance. So given this list, what can a state legislator like me do to solve economic inequality in the state of Arizona? I, I actually think there's quite a lot. I ran on a platform of financial reform and public banking, equality and paycheck fairness, and attacking the opioid crisis. How does my uh, platform dovetail with Dean Baker's? I think it, uh, it overlaps quite a bit when you look at macroeconomics, uh, intellectual property rights and practice protection because these are things that we debate a lot in the Arizona legislature. So when Dean Baker talks about macroeconomics, he's talking about the Federal Reserve Board and them setting the interest rates and the monetary policy and trying to keep the, the, uh, the economy on an even keel. But on the state level, I see macroeconomics as the state budget and that's something that the legislature has a lot of say in. So, yes. <laughs> and so the, this, this budgetary process, like I said, is like our macroeconomics. So the state balances spending and revenue and chooses to invest in some things and to starve other parts of our economy. And I'm sure we all have a list on what's not getting the money that it deserves, right? Uh, so it's a policy document, but it's also a moral document because when the state attaches money to these different programs on different ideas, they're saying what the priority is for the state. And so what does our budget say about the state of Arizona, about our government? It says that they value big corporations more than the people, in my opinion. Arizona's finances are underwater. It, you know, the, um, I won't say it, but you know what hit the fan in the spring <laughs> when it came out that the state was spending $13 billion or giving away $13 billion in, in multiple types of tax cuts, but only saving $9.8 billion to run the state. So, you know, on top of that, there are scheduled uh, more tax cuts coming down the pipe towards us. And the JLBC has said that in the coming year, we will have a $200 million shortfall fall right from the beginning when we start negotiating the budget. So, and there's more, obviously. What Congress is doing is not gonna help us out either. You know, they are going to not only raise taxes on the people, they are going to take money from the state budget. So, you know, we have our own self-imposed austerity, and on top of that, Congress is going to uh, make our make our upside down budget even worse than it already is. So, like I said, Arizona is already in a hole thanks to Republican tax cuts at the state level, and the congressional uh, Republicans are poised to really stick it to us. And I say that the party's over. Okay, we really can't afford trickle down economics anymore. You know, we've been trying it since Reagan. You know, my daughter was a baby during when trickle down economics was first proposed and now she's 36 years old and she tells me you have to get better jobs in Tucson because all of my friends are leaving town because they can't find a job. So we should be focusing on, as progressives, and we should be focusing on taking down whatever those tax breaks we can. I, uh, you've heard me talk about the big book of tax cuts. There's actually a 120 page document, single spaced, that lists every statute that has a tax break attached to it. You know, I think we should be going through that book and seeing what's vulnerable and seeing what we can, what we can take down. I campaigned against those tax breaks last year and what we saw in, uh, in 2017 with the progressives was the progressives drew a line in the sand and they said, we're not giving away any money 
until the schools are made whole. And that was our that was our point. So there was all sorts of things that we voted against, but what was interesting was that there were libertarians who were voting with us. And so you had bipartisan votes, libertarians and progressives. Libertarians who don't want to spend money on anything, and the progressives who didn't want to give money away until the schools were paid for. So we took down a lot of corporate giveaways, but I think this year, the progressives have to stand over that, have to cross that line and say, we're gonna to try to take down some of the existing tax breaks because that's where the money is. We, we can't just continue to give away what we're giving away and starving the state. So one of the things that was heartening this year was that uh, Senator Steve Farley uh, proposed a bill to review all the different tax breaks and all the loopholes. And that bill actually passed the House and the Senate. It, it passed. So there are people on both sides of the aisle who don't like what's going on, but it got stalled because the governor, the governor Ducey vetoed it, right? Because he doesn't want his political rival to get a bipartisan win on something like tax breaks, which are near and dear to his heart. So besides take, taking on the tax breaks, I also think that we should look at the fairness involved in our, in our government, because all too often the state legislature makes decisions that are good in for short-term gain, right? Short-term economic gain or short-term political gain, but in the long term, these decisions cost us money. For example, cutting public education, cutting university budgets, cutting health care for children and families, cutting cash assistance for the poor, cutting child care assistance, delaying road maintenance, starving local governments, limiting the voice of the citizens, enacting anti-woman, anti-immigrant, and anti-worker bills. This is what they're up to, and this is what we have to fight against. These are unfair for the people of Arizona, and we have to say no. So I didn't vote for these things. Did you guys vote for these things? Of course not, right? A, a few months ago, I gave a talk about balancing social responsibility and individual liberty in public policy. Because many, many Americans feel that their government does not represent them anymore. They're frustrated by their government. And my theory is that the reason that people are frustrated and they feel that the system is rigged against them is because it is. Our laws are written by special interest groups and big corporations. In fact, that's one of the tricks that we tried to play several times on Republicans in the House was that when they would start waxing poetic about this bill that they wanted to do, one of us would stand up and say, uh, which constituent group of yours brought this to you? And of course, you know, the constituent group was something like, uh, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield or somebody like that, because there were no people that actually wanted that bill. So anyway, I think that what, what we should look at is instead of you know focusing on what the big corporations on are, we should focus on what the people want. So you know what are the usual what are the usual things that people say they want? Education, jobs, roads, a living wage, safety, justice, voting rights, basic health care, social safety net. That's what the people want. But what are we getting from the politicians? We're getting tax breaks for the big corporations and the one percent. So how do we balance this? I think we need to fight for fairness in our laws. I think that we ought to, instead of investing in things like tax cuts, I think we should invest in the people's to-do list, right? What would happen if we actually invested in education, roads, safety, justice, health care, and a social safety net? What we would do is we would create good paying jobs in those professions. Right now, when we're sending the money outside of the state of Arizona to these multinational corporations, that does nothing to build our economy here, the idea that trickle-down economics works is absurd. But if we invested in these jobs, we would have better paid teachers, we'd have a social safety net, we'd have caregivers for our people. So I think we need to push back, push back against you know the wave that's coming towards us. One other thing that was on Dean Baker's list was uh, intellectual property rights. Now this might seem kind of obscure, but this is actually something that affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. Intellectual uh, property rights patent protection has become longer and stronger over the years. And according to Dean Baker, the U.S. pays $400 billion a year in prescription drugs that would cost us $80 billion a year on the open market if they were generics. And so patent protection, when it's longer and stronger, that costs us more money, particularly in the healthcare, in the healthcare area. 
And intellectual property rights is something we debate in the Arizona House quite often, in fact. Uh, the Intel bill, which was the last big giveaway, giveaway bill that Ducey proposed, uh, part of that was not only giving away sales taxes and other sorts of tax breaks to big corporations like Intel, it was also giving away research dollars, millions of dollars in research to Intel and these big corporations to do high-tech research, not any other kind of research, high-tech research. And so what that does, is it not only gives away money today, that gives away money into the future because you have given those big corporations the property rights. So if they have the patents, then who gets the money in the future for those patents? What if Intel invents the next Ganga computer chip? Even if the state of Arizona, even if you paid for that research, Intel is going to get the money in the future. They, we are not going to benefit from that research. And I think that what we ought to be doing is we should be doing funding research in the university system. Because if we fund research in the university, we're going to get new drug development, we're going to get arid land research, we're going to get any number of things. We're not just going to get high tech. Our, the bill that we passed was only high tech research. A few weeks ago, I toured the Arizona College of the University of Arizona College of Medicine, my old stomping grounds, right? And I met researchers who are doing really, really sophisticated genetic research to come up with the next generation of non-addictive painkillers. Why aren't we funding that research? Why are we only focusing on research that could build bombs and computer chips? We could be funding research that saves lives, and the Arizona legislature used to do that. In the 90s, when I was in the PR department, I remember taking a picture of Carmen Cajero talking to scientists and learning about their research, and the, the legislature used to give ten to $20,000 seed grants to young scientists. This is a clear path to economic development. The university has the data. If, if those, stu those scientists get seed grants and they get preliminary data, they publish that data, they take that data, and they apply for multi-million dollar grants. It's a direct path. And it's absurd that the city and the state are not doing this. It could, you mean, they could put a million dollars into it and do like several different small grants to help these scientists out. And I think that that's a much better uh, use of our funds. So also the other thing is when we do have, uh, you know, money, the research money going to the scientists, if they have a breakthrough, then that, that benefit is shared by the scientist the university and the taxpayers. We get a benefit from the breakthrough and we get a benefit from the intellectual property rights going forward. So I say let's bring back some seed grants for the scientists. So, uh, yes. <laughs> Yay for science, right? <laughs> you know, the, the, other thing, yeah, the other thing that the seed grants would give us and the, the research grants is it's a workforce development issue. Again, these are, these are not bartender and waitress jobs, you know, these are bench science jobs. I, you know, I can't tell you how many hours I spent at the Arizona Cancer Center interviewing and, and meeting all the people who work in the labs and do these breakthroughs. I mean, they're there. We just need to support them. So lastly, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was practice protection. And this is the idea that, uh, you know, like for example, doctors might not want, you know, advanced practice nurses to do certain procedures because they think they're gonna lose money, right? And so this is a hot topic in the legislature. I've only been in office a few months and I can't tell you how many discussions or arguments I've heard over turf wars, right? And last week in the, we had a joint health committee meeting uh, for, so it was the senators and the, uh, and the representatives and we heard three Sunrise applications, and really all of them had to do with practice protection. So a Sunrise application is when uh, somebody brings a new idea and then they have hours of testimony and, and the, the committee kind of says, yeah, this can go forward or we don't want this to go forward, right? And so one of the things that we heard yesterday, I mean last week, was about dental therapy. And so we had a seven hour uh, sunrise application uh, hearing on Tuesday and five hours was on dental therapy. And last year, uh, dental therapy was also up for sunrise and only one person voted for it. Everybody else, Democrats and Republicans, everybody else voted against it. So Senator Nancy Bartow, who's a Republican, she was the only one who voted for it. And this year, going into the uh, hearing, as far as I knew, 
Nancy Bartow and I were the only ones who were, were for it. She's for it because she thinks it's going to save the state money with Medicaid, which she's probably true. You know, I was for it because I see this as an access to care issue for, for people who live in rural Arizona, especially on the tribal lands, but also for people in LD9 and in, in, in the urban areas of Tucson, because there are barriers to dental care. And dental care is so important because, you know, if you lose your teeth or you get rotten teeth or you uh, get some sort of gum disease and lose your teeth, you know, you're less employable and it tumbles down into all sorts of health problems. So we really should be taking care of our teeth and we should help people do this. And so uh, with dental therapy, this would be a person who would be working under a dentist. It's not somebody with a shingle and a pair of pliers, you know, and so they would work under the dentist and they could, you know, work in the office and it's, it's more than like a dental hygienist, right? So this is a person who has a health education component. They do preventive health education in the office, but then they also go out into the community. You know, I mean, I'm old enough or young enough, I guess, to remember when I was in grade school having somebody come in and, and do dental screenings and eye screenings. I'm not sure how much of that is still done, but the dental therapy idea is like, for example, on the Navajo reservation, you can have a dentist in Flagstaff who employs you know, a couple of dental therapists. They go out into the, the hinterlands of the reservation out up the Tuba City and, and all over and they do community screenings. Uh, you know, they do fluoride washes and they also have telemedicine. So they can take a picture of some little kid's mouth and send it to the dentist back in Flagstaff and the dentist could say, tell that kid to brush more or they can say, sign him up for an appointment, he needs to come in and see me. And so there's much uh, distributed care. And in, in addition, it's again, it's workforce development. 22 tribes backed dental therapy. 22 tribes, Chicanos por la Causa, the public health advocates, and the Goldwater Institute, of all people. But what, what, the, uh, what the, the tribe saw is this access to care and for, their, for their people. And they also saw dental therapists as something that tribal members could do, that they could come and they could they could you know get that education and then they could help their uh, their community members live healthier lives. And so, like I said, workforce development and and a, a, a access to care issue. So, and I do agree with Nancy Bardo would probably save the state money. So, and this was a huge fight, and I didn't expect what a fight it was. You know, there were powerful Republicans who were fighting against this. Uh, Jay Lawrence, Regina Cobb, and Debbie Lesko, man, they were just full on fighting against this, asking all kinds of questions and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, I have a master's in public health. I gotta step up my game here, right? And so I, I really fought for uh, access to care and uh, Tony Navarrete, who is also a Democrat, he uh, represents LD30, which is the poorest uh, um, district in the state. He joined me in this fight and talked about how it would help the people in his urban area. And we carried the day. We really carried the day. I'm serious. Don't let anybody tell you that Democrats can't do anything because we're in the minority. So dental care, dental therapy passed 5-4-1. Five, five, so the five who voted for it were Nancy Bartow, Steve Montenegro, and the three, Demo three of the Democrats, Steve, uh, Bradley, Navarrete, and me. So Democrats got that done. Last year, one vote for it. This year, five votes for it. We got it out of there. It will be, <laughs> I, I think it will be good for us. You guys gotta watch it though, because now all we did was we let it go to the legislature. So there's gonna be a bill, it's gonna be fought tooth and nail again. You know, So we have to watch it out, because I, I really do think that it would help us out down here. Uh, the other thing that we passed uh, on uh, that Tuesday was the community health worker voluntary certification. Again, this is a caregiving position. It's a it's another uh, you know job title. If somebody wants to go into healthcare, but you don't want to be a nurse, community health worker. Again, again, it's a it's a community outreach and a health education that would help seniors and the the impoverished areas of our city. So. There's a lot going on, obviously. <laughs> so uh, to conclude, oh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, you know, there's a number of bills coming up. Uh, the Democrats have been meeting. I'm going back to Phoenix tomorrow. We have issues that the House Democrats are working on. Uh, I also think that we need to be, we need to be vigilant down here. 
you know, and we need to look at what's going on, you know, come do the request to speak, please. I mean, it was amazing in 2017, you know, there were so many bills where it's so easy to see who backed it. Because all you had to do is look at the request to speak and you'd see, you know, under uh, four, it would be things like, you know, APS and SRP, uh, you know, um, uh, Americans for Prosperity, you know, people. and then on the other side, there'd be hundreds of people, you know, there'd be three or 400 people sometimes on the no side of something. And so, you know, it would be really obvious. And so, you know, we, we need to have you guys there it, and by, behind our backs. Because obviously we have our work cut out for us, you know. Obviously we have laws that perpetuate economic inequality in our state, and that's how it sets. That's how they're set up, you know. And so I think that uh, this also underscores the idea that we need to get money out of politics. If we have politicians that can be bought, they're going to be bought, you know. And so I hope that you guys will support me in my clean elections bid. I have five dollar forms here. If you're in LD nine, you can give me five dollars. I also have seed, uh, seed uh, money donation envelopes if you're not in nine and you want to support me. And uh, I'll take your questions. <laughs>